You're listening to Kayak Flyer with your host, Sean. This week we're brought to you by Tennessee Trailers Outdoor Adventure Trailers.com, the best way to get your kayak to and from the water. Cutthroat Furled Leaders, the only leaders that I use. Cutthroat Furled Leaders are guaranteed to perform for whatever species of fish you're chasing. Check them out at CutthroatFurledLeaders.com. Save 15% promo kayak. StoneFlyNets.com, the very best in handcrafted and custom fishing nets made in the great state of Arkansas. Check out Stonefly Nets at StoneFlyNets.com. All right, gang, uh, it's great to be back. I tell you what, uh, having it done this for like two weeks, man, it's, uh, we had kind of a layoff period. I don't know what happened. Everybody got busy. Um, Brian from Trout Tornado is back with us, guys. And if you guys haven't checked out his YouTube, man, I'm going to tell you what, he makes some incredible flies and he takes any downsizes some flies and makes them where you can catch, you know, using these, some of these articulated streamers, you can catch the fish that are in your area. And I've even been downsizing some of them for bass, man. I tell you what, they look great. How are you doing today? I'm fantastic. Thank you, Sean. Happy to be with you again. I tell you what, it's been a while, but uh, over the winter and then especially this spring, I really just started back tying streamers and I do a few things different than you've been doing, um, but man, you've got some really killer flies. Yeah, thanks. It all comes from just wanting to catch fish in my local waters, you know, like you said, um, trying to fish those four, six inch patterns just doesn't work. I mean, I'm not 20 anymore, right? I can't yeah. throw a, a seven, eight weight with, you know, those giant flies and sinking line all day. And especially when there's stuff behind me, you just can't cast it. So I just had to downsize it so I could catch fish on my local streams. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of guys and I know a lot of guys, I mean, you know, trout are what they think of when they think fly fishing. And it's it's important to encourage people that you can catch anything on a fly rod. And, you know, just taking what is typically a trout fly, you can fish that for smallmouth bass or largemouth bass and vice versa. If you see a bass fly, a lot of times a trout will take it. So I think there's something about, you know, just understanding that how this works. Yeah. Um, what can I say? I've caught on streamers. I'll just go through a few, some strange ones, right? So carp, yep. walleye, um, you know, now pike and, and musky, those are kind of mainstream, but if it swims, even like hog nose suckers, mm -hmm. I mean, who the heck would think that a hog nose sucker would be that aggressive? And I'm talking big, you know, hog nose suckers, 18 inches. So just smash a streamer. <clears throat> and if you think about it, likely all fish are cannibals. Right. So they see their, the young of the year, they see those small bait fish. What are you going to rather eat? You know, a hundred small um, mayflies or one fly that imitates, you know, a, a crayfish or imitates a, a bait fish. It just from a fish's perspective, I think if they get that sense of, you know, it's alive and it's easy for me to get, it's going to give them that calorie count that they really need to make their lives easier. I think that's the same reason why when I'm really hungry, I want a hamburger instead of trying to fight with all those crayfish to get a little bit of meat out. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. You, you can sit and eat a bowl of popcorn if you want for dinner, but you're going to need like four bags. Exactly. Yeah, versus that hamburger or that steak. That's so funny. Oh. Um, one of the things I was going to say, and I wanted to talk to you about this, almost all of yours that are articulated have double hooks. Right. Now we have um, some protected waters where we're only allowed to use one hook in Missouri. So I have been uh, cranking out uh, hook shanks. I got a little looper tool and some MIG wire. And I've, I've probably got $400 worth of shanks made up because I just sit there in the <laughs> evening while I'm not doing anything, watching TV, talking to the wife and, and do that. But I've managed to put some different shanks on there. And that has really, you know, made it, it's, it's not as effective, you know, quote unquote, for having the two hooks, but I now know I can take those wherever I want to go with my protected waters. Yeah. And there's some waters like that where I fish too. And you just either... You can actually tie it on a hook if you want and sacrifice the hook just by cutting the bottom off 
you get the same as the the shank itself um, or do like you do and just tie that uh, that shank on so before I even knew shanks were there that's how I used to tie my flies I would just you know because sometimes it's easier to get that hook and yep. vice versus the shank you can see that extra gap to be able to wrap around where that shank sometimes is a little limiting and they're also sometimes a little heavier yeah and I find you know the lighter the lighter the wire on the hook the better the back action is of that fly so shanks will shanks will work but if you don't have it you can use a junk hook i mean you don't have to use a you know a nice daiichi or a, a gamagatsu you can use i don't know a bait hook you had sitting around in your tackle yeah. box for 25 years it doesn't matter yeah anything you can fit in that hook and i've even taken uh some really short ones i've made some really short ones and i'll put you know, maybe two articulations in there, especially with the copper top. And oh, yeah. it seems like it, it swims great. I mean, it's a great fly, great design. And that's one that I look at as being a multi-purpose fly. I don't think there's any, I, I think if I got that in front of a catfish, it would take it. Yeah. Um, I mean, that is a beautiful fly. Um, you want to talk about that one in, uh, in particular for a minute and the success you've had with it? Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll start by saying you can learn how to tie it on YouTube. At this point, it's had 23,000 views, which just absolutely blows me away. Um, the fly, you know, is inspired by Kelly Gallup. Um, Kelly has a fly called Laser Legal. Mm -hmm. And so the, the platform and the foundation is based on that fly itself. Again, I downsized it. Um, the materials in... You know, the top part of this fly, if you look at it, it's got an olive and it's got a copper material that basically blends in together. And when you look at it in the water, um, it just gives that impression of, you know, a young smallmouth bass, a young brown trout, um, a young, I would say, like hognose sucker, right? It, it's just got mm -hmm. that kind of golden copperish look to it, why it's called the copper top. And then the belly has got more of a, a white foundation to it. So it's an articulated fly. The back hook is a Daiichi 2460, size number six. The front hook is a B10. I think it's a size six or an eight. And you put a tungsten bead on it. And, you know, like you said, Sean, when you put it in the water, if you just hold it in the current, it kicks and it moves and it articulates and it looks alive without putting any action on it. Um, but my favorite way to, you know, fish that fly is by casting it upstream and putting a bow in the line and it's called a fish hook. It's basically putting tension on your fly. So as the fly comes downstream, it's going head first. So it's articulating going downstream and you fish it in places where, you know, the, the bass, the trout, um, walleye, carp, I've caught all sorts of fish on it are waiting in in late you know they're waiting for that meal to come down the stream and they see it and they just absolutely smash it um in in the introduction to that copper top video there was one day um which isn't abnormal i i, I mean it, it was a day i caught smallmouth walleye carp on that fly within a two-hour period it was just insane <clears throat> and it in in a video that i just did I was fishing for trout exclusively um, and I caught a 20, it was a 20, it was a skinny 20, but it was a 20 inch brown trout on the copper top and I caught like three or four on it. So it's extremely versatile and that color combination, that copper, olive, white, just really looks good and does something to trigger those fish. Yeah. And you know, it's, when you come to talk about some of these articulated flies and a lot of them have those deer hair heads. And man, I have fought with deer hair. I finally, I think I, I bought like six packs of deer hair the other day. I'm like, I'm going to learn how to do this. Yeah. Um, and I tried uh, tying up some mini dungeons or mini cougars. One, I can't remember which one I was, try I was messing with the other day. Yeah. Um, but working on that and then going over and tying the copper top, it's, it, there's a, a world of difference in how easy it is to tie the copper top. The cost of materials, you're using a lot of stuff from FTD. Great folks. The mad scientist is a great guy. And, you know, it's it's a really good fly that you can use, you can catch, and it's it's you're not going to spend hours trimming and cutting the deer hair with it. Oh, God. I know. Deer hair drives me crazy, too. 
you know, the biggest tip I give you and everybody else is to make sure that you buy quality deer hair. Yep. That's number one. But number two is to make sure you have quality thread. Because yep. when I was just starting out tying deer hair, I'd be putting tension on it, you know, and it would just pop and it would just completely blow, you know, the fly. And so by just putting a little super glue down and then I use what's called Vivas um, thread and it's a gel spun and you can get away with Vivas 100, which is pretty strong. But if you want stuff that'll never break, it's called Vivas and it's 200 and it just stands for the total number of strands that you have in the thread itself. Yeah. And then you don't have to worry about breaking it, which is awesome. You know, that can be so frustrating. Oh yeah. I think I was using some nano silk and it seemed like that was just entirely too slick. And I had to switch over to a different thread because the nano silk, I guess it's, it's kind of a gel spun, but it's, it's really, really slick. And so I was having a little bit of problem getting it to go where I wanted to. And I switched threads and about the fifth one came out looking all right. So I've got four to give to my buddies. Um, so, and you've got to be careful because I was tying them on like a size six front hook and I was bending the hook all over the place in my vice whenever I was pulling on it. So I'm like, eh, that that's, one's going to go to, that's going to grant. That's, so that's, that's funny. That's the other thing you have to do is make sure you have a vice that can hold on to it. I remember there's a fly that, um, that I tie. It's the, um, the mini, the heck is it? The mini. Anyway, it requires those micro shanks, yeah. uh, the freshwater flounder, for example. Yes. Yes. It, and I used to have, and I, I still love the Dyna King vices, so I don't want to, you know, badmouth them, but I'll say I went to an HMH, which has a little smaller jaws and you can really crimp the crap out of that, you know, micro shank so that as you're reefing and pulling on it, just like with that deer hair, if your hook starts to slant, you got to put it back up and tighten it back down. It's just another nightmare, right? I mean, yeah. try to avoid those as best you can. Yeah, that's, and you know, speaking of vices, I know we're, we're sort of bouncing all over the place, but you know, that's my show. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you like the HMH? Because I've been thinking about this summer, picking up a different vice. I've got the, uh, I've got the, uh, Dyna or not the Dyna. I've got the, uh, uh, Odyssey spider, uh, from Griffin Yeah, and it's great with big stuff. Um, it really doesn't like a lot of the smaller stuff, at least the one I've got, um, how do you like the HMH? I, I've fallen in love with it. Um, it. If you look at the, the way that the vice itself is designed, the head of it, it looks a little bit like a, a diamond. And when you put a, you, like I, I was just tying some, uh, some dry flies and it's small enough that you can tie a number 20 easy dry fly off it. But if you want, because I'm getting ready for a saltwater trip, I can put a two watt hook in there. No issue, no problem. And as I said, those micro shanks, you can crank them down. And it'll hold it right there. And that, you know, that's the most important thing for me is once I set that hook or that shank, I don't want it to move. So I really like it. Um, one of my good friends and fly fishing mentors um, introduced me to, uh, to HMH and, you know, he tied commercially for. 25, 30 years. And he was using an HMH at the end of, you know, his tying as well. So it tells me not only for a guy like me who just likes to tie for, uh, for fun, right. But yeah. also for commercial tires, it's a really, you know, great, uh, great, great vice. Yeah. And that's, I've noticed you and I've noticed several other people that have been using them lately. And it's, it's one of those that I, I haven't started, you know, looking around yet, but it's like, I know kind of what I want and I'm going to keep my vice, um, because I do tie some four ot and stuff and it'll handle that. Um, but I just wanted to find something that was just a little bit better for the smaller stuff. And I know, you know, you start looking at some of these and you've got to buy this jar, or that jar, or you've got it, you know, there's, there's a lot of things. And we, as a fly fisherman in the Midwest, um, I think it's really hard to pick out one set of like jaws because you may be tying a size 20, you know, that's, that's, I've, I've tie 18 mosquitoes all the time. Um, but you know, there are times when I want to tie <laughs> a two odd hook, you know, or a number two hook and go out and, you know, slay the bass. And so it is really kind of an interesting 
predicament we get into where we're like, oh, I'm going to do this. And it's like, oh, I need another vice or, oh, I need another this or, oh, I don't have that in this color. I'll tell you what. Yeah. I, I started, it's funny, with a Griffin vice, you know, and that's mm-hmm. 30 plus years ago. And that vice I still have, it sits downstairs and, you know, I, I don't know why it's there. I should probably sell it, but it, it just, I guess there's sentimental value to it. Yeah. And, and I would say for anybody that's beginning in fly fishing, don't be afraid of just getting a beginner's vice and just getting into it and trying it and see if you like it. Don't spend a huge amount of money on, you know, a Renzetti, a Dyna King, HM, just get a, you know, a nice entry level vice. And odds are when you get into the sport too, like I'm part of a, a club and they're guys, you know, who have like me, they have like three or four different vices and um, they're willing to offload, you know, some of their vices when they get to a certain point. So there's always opportunities to upgrade. You don't always have to buy them uh, brand new. Yeah, that sort of reminds me, um, Rick from Oasis Benches. Um, they've got a, a club out there in Arizona and one of the members had passed away and the guy's son is like, I don't tie flies he's like here take this stuff and so they wound up putting a bunch of the stuff for sale and they're taking that money and donating to the apache trout fund to keep those trout there and it's like you know i don't think i've ever seen anybody who quit fly tying because they ran out of materials towards the end you know (laughs) (laughs) i mean just the amount of and colors and everything else it's it's a you almost have to have a separate room just for it you know (laughs) yeah 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 i'm i'm smiling because you know i've gone through a bunch of different phases in my fly fishing career i i started out as a dry fly guy then i went to nymphing then i went to euro nymphing and then i went to wet flies and then i went to streamers so i've kind of done it all and i'm just thinking about like my wet fly phase I have a bin, you know, because I spent time with Davey Watton and I have a bin of feathers, you know, just hen hackles and um, mole hair, just all sorts of crazy crap and colors of, you know, thread and the nano silk, all this stuff that is so specific to, uh, to wet flies. And it's in a bin and it sits in the basement. And so... With each one of my phases of, you know, fly fishing, I have a, it's now like a garbage bag of stuff that I, I can't keep it all in one place. It's just, it's freaking, it's too much. So, yeah, yeah. that's, I've got, you know, some storage stuff set up down here and I've got it all labeled with feathers and fur and, you know, this and that and natural hair and blah, blah, blah. And so I sort of am organized and I'm like, I need about two more of those because you can't just have feathers together. You have to have all the different types of feathers. And I'll say to my wife, oh, I need to go by the fly shop. What do you need to get? I need to get, what? you have some of that. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, but it's a different color. It's I, not quite webby enough. You know, I know. I know. I'll tell you what, it's, uh, it, yeah, I could never afford drugs. I'm too busy tying flies. You know, I think that's, <laughs> that's how you, the, the war on drugs right there is how you end it. Get kids into fly tying. There's some pretty good Instagram posts um, that I've seen where, you know, the guy is standing outside of the fly shop. He's like, hey, hey, you got this stuff? Yeah, yeah. And he hands him, you know, like uh, five flies. And, you know, that's like the the drugs that they're they're searching. And there's another one that's uh, equally funny. A guy's all excited. He's got 150 bucks. And uh, he goes into, you know, he's like, hey, I got $150. I just got paid and I'm going into the fly shop and I'm going to get this, 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 and this. And he comes out and he's got like four things. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you what, man. It is insane. Some of the prices on this stuff. And, uh, yeah. you know, uh, we had the folks from the fly armory on the other day and they're doing quail skin. So it's the full quail. And I'm going to tell you what, those things are, those are good looking, but you can't have just one. I mean, they are that good looking and, and tie up really well, especially if you're going to try to uh, do some nymphs and even some small streamers. Really neat, sort of like partridge. But I'm just sitting here looking at everything and I'm going, man, oh, man, oh, man. Yeah, it's at least, right, 40 bucks, right, at a minimum yeah. for one. Yeah. 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 So I just bought my um, first jungle cock skin. 
my first, I bought it and I bought it from my friend that I got the um, HMH vice from. Mm -hmm. So I got a deal on it. It's beautiful. And I've been fly tying and fly fishing, I don't know, 35 years. And it's the first one that I've ever bought. And it's been like that one, you know, material. Well, those were outlawed, weren't they, for a long time? Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I hope not. <laughs> I remember hearing. I remember hearing um, a guy talking about how he had one that he had bought in the seventies, and then they went on an endangered species list or something, and like he couldn't tie with it. What? Oh, and then shit. now I'm, they're I'm back. With this stuff, I'm, I'm just saying. This stuff. No, I don't think so. I don't know. He may have been pulling my leg. I'd like to find out, though, because it was like, it was sort of like a taboo subject there for a little while. Yeah. But he, he, you know, he may have been drinking, too. I don't know. He was a dentist, so. (laughs) I know some of the most beautiful streamers that I've ever seen are tied with that jungle cock. Yeah. You know, the traditional, like, uh, Carrie Stevens streamers for landlocked salmon. They have those. Kenny Abrams, um, who fishes uh, stripers or used to and wrote Striper Moon and The Perfect Fish, he uses them for his striper flies. And there's just something about it. It's uh, The feather itself is beautiful. From what I understand, it has uh, specific ultraviolet properties. And so I don't know. I, I can't wait. I can't wait to tie it on a couple streamers. I'll never use that feather in a video to like share out on YouTube. You, yeah. I mean, the materials that I try to use on the flies that I share, everybody is going to have, or they're like, you know, a buck 50 or 250 a piece. I, I really try to think I want a broad audience. I want a fly that's going to work, not something that's so niche specific where you have to go and buy a jungle cock skin. Cause that's just, right. that's just crazy. Yeah. And that's one of the things about that I like about your, your channel is I either have the stuff or I can make a couple of substitutions here or there where a lot of these, and I won't name any of the names, of course, unless they want to sponsor me and then I'll, I'll talk about them all the time. But a lot of these guys will send out, you know, weekly videos and in the video link, you know, you can go and buy everything for the fly. And it's, it's a good idea. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's for marketing. It's great because you can just sit there and go, yeah, I want this, 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 and this, and I want to tie that. But, you know, when you can look at what the average guy might have, and then you can build a fly off that, that's the way, in my opinion, that's the best way to do it. I I think you're hitting the nail on the head. A lot of the channels that are out there, especially those that are being run by fly shops, Mm -hmm. you know, are promoting buying materials and specific tools. And I don't know, it it rubs me the wrong way, really. You know, I I think to get a broad material substitution is key. It's easy. You don't need to buy the exact hook. You don't Mm -hmm. need to buy like they have those 3D beads. I was yeah. looking at this the other day. I got my um, my Feathercraft uh, catalog, which I absolutely love. I, I love too. that feather. I love it. But there there are three D beads that they have in there. They're craft beads. Yeah. And I was looking. I'm like, why the hell would you spend money on a bead when you can go to Michael's Craft Store, which is where I get all my beads. You know, they're glass beads. They're eight o, and you get a thousand for five dollars yeah right i i just it's funny that's that's okay i mean we're, we were talking about the articulated shanks a while ago right. okay 32 bucks for two pounds of 0.035 wire stainless wire right. and 25 bucks for the tool and how many pounds i i can send you a half pound of shanks right now if you want them i mean i'm telling you you know, and that's, that's not much. They're running what? $7 a pack for 10, you know? So, I mean, you're on, I've already bought more shanks than what this cost me. And I probably already used enough to make, make up for it. But, you know, for something so simple and, you know, a lot of the fly guys are DIY guys. And, you know, we see a lot of that and there's some things all DIY and some things, no, I'm not going to. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna try to make a dubbing brush table when Oasis makes a great one. Correct. You know, I'm yeah. not, <laughs> that's above my talent skill. But you know, shanks, something that's cheap like that, or going to the hobby store and picking up stuff. You know, great ways to do things. Here, here's the other thing that drives me crazy. If I was to go upstairs into my fly tying room right now, it, 
I have, and I've thrown out just as many, I have a dozen old pairs of fly tying scissors. Yep. And I just, my daughter today, she went to Michael's and she said, dad, do you need anything? And I said, yep, I need a new pair of Fisker's scissors. And they, for anybody that hasn't tried Fisker's scissors for fly tying, I strongly encourage you to do it. The pair that I have upstairs, I know because I wrote it on the handle, this is how anal and retentive I am and interested in this stuff, <laughs> is from May from 2020. Oh, Lord, so, yeah. Yeah, so it's two years old, this pair of scissors that I've had. And all the flies that you see in my videos, because I just started my channel a year ago, have yep. all been tied with that and a year in front of that. So great they're eight dollars, you know, yeah. and it lasts for two years. And what these are what, like twenty-five. Right on. You know? Um, one of the funny things, if I can see it sitting here in my bench, um, we talk about, you know, using different colors and stuff. I've started using a lot more white. Um, and Mike from the Frugal Fly Rider really turned me on to it. Um, and he does it two ways. And the easiest way to do it is you take a Sharpie and a can of compressed air. And you hold that Sharpie and you just blow that compressed air across that Sharpie and paint with it. Oh, really? uh, yeah. And so it just blows it out with the compressed air. And the other thing that um, he actually sent me the link to when I bought it, it took forever to get here. It was on like a slow boat from China, but it's, um, it's looks like an airbrush and I have an airbrush. So I already have the compressor, which is why I got it. Um, but you put a Sharpie into the top of that and the Sharpie meets where the blowhole is and it just blows it. And then it, you can control it more like an airbrush because it's got a trigger and everything. But I'm like, you know, guys sitting here wanting to, you know, when you're mixing or blending stuff, or if you're just doing a bait fish, just a, let's just say you're making a small game changer and you want to hit a little silver on the bottom, a little green on the top, man, that's a great way to do it. And you can always just take a marky and sharp or, you know, mark uh, Sharpie and marker it up. But I, the spray gives it a whole nother level that, you know, it's just a really simple thing. I mean, most of us have a, you know, thing of canned air at the house we can try. Yeah. You know? I'm, I'm going to have to try that out. I, I did buy, it was a, um, a Copix compressed yeah. air. Yeah. Which I thought was pretty, uh, pretty cool. Yeah. Those, it's basically the same thing, only it's with a Sharpie, but yeah. And it's, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, we, we, I think we care sometimes more than the fish care. Yeah, no doubt. You know, um, it's, it's like, it's so Put, funny. I mean, my my patterns, you'll notice, they don't have eyes on them. They yeah. rarely they rarely do. Like the copper top, there's no eye on it. But what I found through my Instagram channel is that if you don't put eyes on it, it doesn't attract the same volume of likes as something that has the eyes on it. Mm -hmm. So you have to add them for likes, but I'll tell you the fish, they don't they don't care. No well, that's the master splinter people putting ears on it. Right. Wow. I'm like, dude, that's, you know, but like you said, if you want somebody to, to purchase it or to, to comment on it or to say something, you know, you really have to, to put that together and, and do those things. And I, it just cracks me up sometimes. I just, I laugh because, you know, I think we all know that it's not necessary, you know, but there's still something in us when we see it. It's like, Ooh, I do like that. Right. Yeah, I do. I've heard Kelly Gallup say, you know, are you going to take it out of your fly box if it doesn't have X on it? And I think, yeah. you know, that's a big part of it, but you're right. For those of you that don't know what the hell a master splinter is, it's a mouse and yeah. it's about this big. And so if it's, if you're mousing at night in the dark, you're waking the fly. There is nothing in the world that's going to see ears or eyes. All they're going to see is just a gurg basically a gurgler coming mm -hmm. across the, the water itself. So yeah, with just a little bit of and that fur just pulsates a little bit underneath it. And you know, you're right there. Yeah. And you know, same thing with frog patterns, you know, um, I don't know why I got some of the, uh, uh, foam from um river road creations i love using his stuff and i got some of the foam that looked like you know a frog back and i'm sitting here and i'm tying these all up and i'm all excited and i'm like they're never gonna see the back of this no 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 never yeah but it, just it, again as long it, if if we look at our fly box and we see one that has eyes and it gives us an extra level of confidence right that when we're fishing it 
Yeah, we're, oh, I'm going to catch fish. You may stick with that pattern longer. So. Yeah, and I've taken white foam and like done the whole marker trick, the Sharpie trick, and made real light orange around the sides of it like an actual frog would have where it would move up. And I'm sitting there thinking, they're looking up into the sky from the water. They're not going to see that color on it. But it makes me happier. So, you know. I, I do. I am a, a huge fan of um, Kelly Gallup, though. And mm-hmm. I do think there's a lot to do with the primary colors yep. and making sure that you, you know, change your, your colors and your transitions to try and identify what color those fish are on, even if it's for that uh, short duration. Yeah, so when uh, those streamers are in that water, I, I do think, especially when they're you know down five six feet, I really think it does matter. Yeah, we've invited Kelly on the show, and uh, we don't have enough listeners for him. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. he costs a little bit of uh, of money too. Yeah, I have a, a friend of mine, our, well, his former podcast guest lives in town. Uh, she used to work for him, and so she reached out. And she's like, "Oh, hey," and he's like, "Well, how many?" People? And I'm like, <laughs> "Thanks." <laughs> Yeah. He seems like a nice enough guy. So, but his flies are amazing. I mean, and then Brian Wise out of the Ozarks, his flies are another one that I mean, he's doing some stuff with. And again, they're monster flies, but you can make them smaller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I noticed that they've got him in the new Feathercraft magazine. I saw that too. It made me smile. Yeah, yeah. there Davy Watton's in there too. So they're. Yeah. I don't know where they're based out of, but it seems like they like those Arkansas guys a lot. I think uh, Brian is, if he's probably around the Springfield area, if I had to guess, by judging where all I've run into him at and that sort of thing and, and seen where all of you, he's been, I'd have to say he's around that area. I know he comes to St. Louis once in a while to Feathercraft and does some demos and stuff, but, you know, um, he's he seems to be pretty much in that southwest Missouri area. And so there you've got the White River You've got the Norfolk, um, you've got the, uh, for warm water, you've got the elk, which is really good. I mean, you've got so many great fisheries over there. It's just absolutely amazing. And uh, I actually got to go to the Salbug Roundup down in Mountain Home. Um, yeah, it's just a short drive from Cotter. And man, I'm going to tell you what, talking about and looking at some of these guys and what they're tying, it was, it was an absolute blast. I think you would really enjoy it. A guy could walk around there, pay us five bucks to get in. I think it's five bucks for all three days. Walk around the fly box and every stand you go by, there's somebody tying flies and you could walk out with 150 flies. Oh yeah. Well worth the price of admission. I, I, I like, I like to go to shows like that around me. I've got uh, the New Jersey show Mm -hmm. um, because it's always great to see what other tires are doing and what they're thinking and how they're blending and putting materials together. Um, for me, you know, that's what I, I try to get out of Instagram is inspiration from, you know, other tires, uh, because, you know, it's one thing to sit and tie on your own or with your club members, you have inspiration from, you know, 20, 30, 40 guys, but, Man, when you go to one of those shows, you just see everybody doing different things and blending materials in different ways and using hooks and shanks. And it's just, it's inspiring. And you always walk away going, man, I can do, you know, this X, Y, Z, P, D, and Q, which is, which is awesome. Yeah. And you know, one of the coolest, I mean, there were a lot of cool things down there, but there was this one guy who was just tying a real simple leech pattern, but he put a little bit of squirrel tail on it and it just totally changed the way it looked and it just i'm like okay well i'm never tying a leech unless i do that now i mean it was it was amazing and you know everybody and it wasn't a fishing show so you know the only rods for sale were twenty five hundred dollar handmade bamboo rods oh jeez. you know i mean th- that was it and then rick had his stand down there i was helping him uh fly armory had their stuff down there because they're right there by it um Dooley's fly shop had his shop down there but everything else was just people tying flies. And so, I mean, if you just, you just would get up and go from table to table and just work your way around. And it was such a great experience to see, you know, guys who were masters like, uh, Mike George master with deer hair, you know, and then you slide over and you got the tattooed fly tire making these giant streamers out of just nothing but marabou and schlapping. You know, it was absolutely amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Uh, it is cool. And that I think is part of the sport too, that makes it exciting. You know, there's always innovation going on. You know, I think back 
20 years ago when I was, you know, just tying, mm -hmm. you know, tying flies and where we are today. You know, there were arguments back then about whether a steelhead would actually take a fly. Yeah. And I remember I was using, uh, you know, a zip gun and we were catching steelhead on uh, twister tails um, in the Great Lakes. And there were uh, three guys, there were only three guys on this whole river that were using a fly rod. And I remember going and talking to them. I'm like, you know, what are you guys doing? But you think you think today, right? It's not even a question if um, steelhead take flies. They absolutely do, and you can you know you can catch them. There were discussions about synthetics. Should synthetics be considered even uh, you know a fly today, right? Mm -hmm. And you look at the flies that um, like Blaine Chocolate used with the gummy worm or the mm -hmm. gummy minnow, right? That was one of the first ones where it was entirely synthetic. Um, just made basically out of that rubber material. And there's a lot of flies today that are like that. So I don't know. That's a cool thing for me. Like you go to a fly shop, you go to one of those fly shows, you just get inspired by the materials. You go to Michael's craft store, right? Or Hobby Lobby and you see all sorts of amazing things there and just start thinking, okay, how can I integrate this into the fly? What will it do? Oh yeah. It's absolutely amazing. I mean, the the simple thought you know i took a little class i was interested in, in learning to fly tie and i took a little class and the guy was only teaching stuff for trout and you know he taught the woolly bugger as only the option to get to know how to use the materials like you didn't fish it you know you fished these nymphs and these cracklebacks and you know these renegades and this is what you fished and and it kind of put me off for a while because I just, I was going to have to buy a ton of material that was expensive and it just, it was really small and really fine work. And I'm sitting here going, man, you know, and so then when bass started tying bass stuff and I'm like, okay, now I can work my way down. And I think that's something that, that frustrates a lot of guys when they're tying, they want to start tying some of this stuff for trout. Well, you really need to learn how to tie something bigger and get all your management down when you get ready to tie something smaller. Yeah. So if you're, you know, especially when, you, when you're talking about your streamers too, I mean, yours aren't as bad, you know, using the two hooks, you know, but whatever you're starting to do that, you know, make sure you give yourself the room you need and understand the materials you're using. And, and, it, and there is a learning curve. You can't just sit down and do it. Even if you're a good tire, uh, it, you know, it usually takes two or three to figure out what you're doing. Yeah. Without a doubt, I have, and I used to have a lot more. I've given, you know, a lot away over the years, but I have bins of flies, streamers, mm -hmm. just streamers. I mean, dry flies too, nymphs too, right? Where I've gone through, I've tried to tie. I sold the first fly that I tied, as a matter of fact. And it just looks like this. The hair is going everywhere. It was an attempt at a dry fly and it looks like a, nothing. <laughs> Um, I'm sure the trout wouldn't care, right? I'm sure the trout right. would still eat it or, yeah. or a bass or whatever. Um, but it does. It, it takes time. It takes practice. And the other thing that I think is really, really important to, uh, to share as well is not only having the perfectly tied, just having the perfectly tied fly doesn't mean that you're going to catch the fish. Right. There is a lot you have to spend. And I don't want to sound like an old you know, curmudgeon, right? Fly fisherman. But you do have to spend time on the stream. And I grew up, you know, using MEP spinners and mm -hmm. Rapalas. And that's how I learned where the small mouth, the large mouth, the pike, the walleye, the, the trout, where everything mm -hmm. lived and where their feeding spaces were and where their holding lies were and what they would do. Because to just start with a fly rod, and even having the perfect fly and trying to catch a fish is going to be a huge, huge, huge challenge. Yeah. I mean, especially when you get to the point I've fished with guys before and I'm like, dude, you're not going to catch a fish. Oh, I'll do just fine. I'm like, dude, you can see the fish. The fish can see you, man. And he'll walk away from a hole, just disgusted. And I'll step back about 20 feet and you know, <laughs> lay one in there and I can get a fish. And it's like, dude, it's, you weren't doing anything wrong other than just standing too close to the fish, right. you know, and there's a lot of little things like that, that you don't, Oh, I see the fish. I'm going to cast right to it. No, get back. It's in the hole. Get back <laughs> and cast over there. Um, and it's, it's amazing. And like you say, just knowing how to fish, I know a lot of guys like me were, and you were gear fishermen 
and we enjoyed fishing and we sort of learned where stuff was. And then you go from doing a big crankbait or a big spinner bait or something that's going to make a whole lot of noise and get them really riled up to go into something that's a little bit more finesse and, you know, and knowing your rivers, um, crawfish, this is one of my favorite stories crawfish my favorite river in my area all the crawfish are mottled you know orange and brown that's what they are you throw an orange and brown crawfish fly they will not pay attention to it they won't i have thrown hundreds and they don't and you make them black and green boom they won't hit the bottom of the water I don't know what it is, but it's like, it's like match the hatch. It's like, oh no, not here. (laughs) This is, this is not a match the hatch scenario. You know, (laughs) you're not going to catch them with those crawfish that are the same color as those. And it's weird, but there, there's funny things about different rivers like that. And one river, it, that might be a match the hatch situation with the crawfish. Another one, it's not, you know, there's no, no perfect scenario. Here's another glimpse into how anal I am about this uh, this stuff and this sport. So since 2000, so 22 years ago, since 2000, I've kept a log of every time I've gone fly fishing, every time I've gone fishing. You don't drink enough. Uh, I drink plenty, but that I have. So for every river, I can tell you where I've caught the fish, on what I've caught the fish, what the conditions were from like a sun, rain, flow perspective, it's pretty anal. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but I'll, I'll tell you this, when I go to a stream in August, I at least know what the flies were that I've caught fish on in the past. And it gives me a little bit of an edge and a little bit of an advantage. Well, now what you need to do is you need to talk to like Tim Camisa or somebody that's done a book, do a fly tying book, and then publish all of those pages. Oh, dear with Lord. E- <laughs> with yeah. each fly. Oh, so people Lord. have a manual. Oh, my and then God. And you'll, you'll never have your favorite fishing hole again. <laughs> oh, man. Well, with my job, I've I've moved quite a bit. So oh. I, I have um, rivers on there like the St. Joe's River in Indiana. Yeah. And it flows from Indiana all the way into Michigan. So there's uh, there's all different rivers from all different states to Maine. When I was fishing for striped bass up uh, up there, Connecticut, when I was out on the Sound. So I'm telling you, I don't you're know. I've been that. I've been fortunate, but yeah, there's there's information I, I would share with others because I'm not there anymore. You know? <laughs> yeah, you're sitting on a gold mine, man. <laughs> Turn that into a book. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. The other, oh. the other thing that I was going to say is even when you have that fly, you got to learn how to, you know, fish it. Um, and one of the things that I try to stress in my videos and I'm, I'm doing some vlogs and I'm kind of playing with the, the content, you know, and, and the way that I do it is to show people how I'm fishing the flies. So I'm not afraid to share, Hey, um, you know, I'm fishing with the crystal light. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've got my top fly is a microburst and, you know, I'm, I'm doing X just to try and give people a little bit of insight because I'm not sponsored, right? I don't have people giving me stuff. I'm not trying to sell stuff. I'm just telling you what works in hopes that people go, Hey, you know, this guy trout tornado, you know, knows his shit. He's been doing it for a long time and, and give him a, give him a follow up that that's all I'm looking for. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the things when, you know, because I know there are a lot of guys that get stuff, you know, I'm one of them, you know, with the podcast, but sometimes I feel obligated whenever I'm making a fly to maybe substitute something for, you know, like fly tires dungeon, you know, because he's been so nice to me over the years. And so, you know, you sort of have that guilt perspective into part of it, but then again, it's like, well, you know, I do use it because it works really well. (laughs) I love fly tires dungeon. I know. I know. And it's like, Oh, I've been making dubbing brushes uh, with one of Rick's tables and using the the FTD big game hair. Oh, my Lord, they're beautiful. Um, But, you know, again, you're talking, you know, and you can make them really small. I've made some really small uh, crappie jigs out of it. But uh, it's just amazing um, the way you can go in and and tweak a fly and it works on one river. And, you know, you've got to tweak it just maybe in color or something else for another river or size. 
Um, you know, little things like that. And then little things that aren't even flies. Um, one of my best producers down at, uh, Spring River is just, it's a white, uh, it's one of the dubs that FTD has. Um, but it's the white marabou or excuse me, not marabou, but the white, uh, dubbing with the rubber legs in it. Oh, and yeah. you just tie it on a small jig and it looks like a little piece of flesh, you know, and man, they nail it, you know, and it's like, it doesn't even look like a fly. And then people are like, oh, well, that's cheating. And it's like, well, you know, it might be, but so it's putting a hook on your indicator. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Bobber, bobber fishing. Bobber fishing. I'm telling you what, that's what yeah. I always use a grasshopper. That way it's a hopper dropper. Yeah, that works. Yeah. It's not yeah. an indicator. It's a hopper dropper. It, it's uh, whatever. <laughs> it works. I've had, I've been an indicator fisherman. I've done it for years. Um, and I remember having trout come up and try to take my indicator. Oh yeah. 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 And I when you're nymphing, you know, I mean, that's, out. yeah. And it's normal. I mean, when you're nymphing or especially when you're, you're, we've got a couple of places in the pond in the winter that put trout in the pond and, you know, you want to throw a nymph, but you don't want it to hit the bottom. You know, that's what you do. And there's, there's no shame in it. But again, it goes back like you were saying, when people were arguing arson, or is it still a fly if it has synthetics on it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and um, I, as you were talking, I was, I was thinking about different, you know, ways that I, I tweak my flies and I'll, I'll share this too, which is I have, um, I have two different boxes that I use, which is one for high water, you know, and one for, uh, low water conditions. So it, it just as an example, like we were talking about the copper top, um, it, it has a tungsten bead on it you can always tie that fly and you can put a brass bead on it or you can put no bead on it. Right. And mm -hmm. what will happen, or you put a glass bead on the front instead of, you know, a, um, a brass or a tungsten with the tungsten, it's going to drop. I mean, if you just take it and you know, you have, um, like your, your sink, you drop right. it directly into that sink. You're going to watch it go right to the bottom, you know, within a second, you take a brass head, you put it on there. It'll take, you know, two seconds to get to the bottom. You have no weight, you drop it on, it's just going to sit there basically on the top of the water. Mm -hmm. And it's really important, depending on the flows and the speed of the water, to pick that right fly or a combination of flies um, to get that to get them into the zone and to not leave that zone quick quickly. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's very important. Is and um just understanding how where the water column where they're at. That's a huge, especially on deeper water, being knowing where you can get it to and where it should be and where it shouldn't be. That is absolutely huge. I've noticed that so much in the last three or four years. Um, I'll throw it and it'll be under the fish and they won't look at it. I'll throw it. It'll be over the fish and they won't look at it. And you sort of change some things and you try to get it right in that zone because when it gets hot, sometimes they get lazy yeah. and they want it right there where they're at because they know that's the optimal oxygen or temperature. You know, so you can learn a lot just by watching where the fish are hanging and how deep or how shallow they're hanging in the column to learn what you need to do for your fishing. And and I cheat, Sean. I, I cheat. You shock them? <laughs> I, I, I use two. No, I use two flies. <laughs> I don't shock them. No, I, I've never done that. But I, I'll use like a tungsten fly on the bottom mm -hmm. and then I'll use a zero, you know, zero weight on the top and I'll use four feet, five feet between the two. And then you've got one that's running three to four feet down below. And then the other is within the top foot of the water column. Right. And the fish will, you know, tell you. And the cool thing about that is you can say, ah, I want to use two different styles of flies. Cool. I want to use two different colors of flies. Cool. Right. And then you're in two depths. So it just helps you, you know, solve the Rubik's cube of uh, fly fishing a lot, uh, a lot quicker. Oh yeah, definitely. I'm a big fan of that. And like I said, hopper droppers are something I really like for trout, especially in the later parts of the year, because you've still got that subsurface nymph there going, and then you've got a, a, something on top. Um, one of the things I did want to talk to you about real quick, you mentioned it earlier, the freshwater flounder. Yeah. I love the look of that. How, how effective has that been for you? Yeah, uh, it is uh, one of my favorite winter flies, I would say. Um, and, and the reason why, and I've caught smallmouth, walleye, brown trout, and rainbow trout on it. And, and the reason why is because I like to fish it slow and I like to fish it deep. And for those of you that haven't seen it, 
it's basically tied on micro shanks on a jig hook with a tungsten bead up front. And it's on the game changer platform, but it's only an inch and a half or so long. Um, in video, I tie it white, but my most productive pattern or color is black. Okay. And I think it's because it imitates perfectly a leech. Yep. Um, yeah. So winter time, it's one of my top, uh, top flies. Yeah, I know I'm going to be trying one of those out soon when I get out to the river because there's actually um, one of the rivers I fish. If you go up a certain point, you don't want to wade because of leeches and leech patterns are killer. So I'm going to try it there and see what happens. Um, but there are some large ditch pickles in that little hole of water. So, yeah, they're they're feeding on leeches a lot. Oh, yeah. Um, but, yeah, you don't want to wet wade after a certain point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well the cool you know, thing is what color are your leeches sean they're like a, a grayish almost black gray black kind of color yeah so you can change up that center yeah. color for something gray and then have the black on the outside it's cool because you can yeah. blend those colors or or just take yeah multiple laser dubs and yeah. blend them together yeah to get the, yeah. the cool colorations Oh yeah, it's awesome. It's so cool just the different things we can do. Is there a fly you're working on now? Is there one you're working on now that we can expect to see a video of soon? Oh man. I've been so I've been playing with a bunch of different flies. The short answer is yes, but what I'd like to do is make sure that it's not just a fly that doesn't catch fish. The one, the one that I have right now that's very simple and I think is going to absolutely crush fish, and you can see it on my Instagram, it's a uh, gummy uh, sand eel. Mm -hmm. And it's super easy to tie. Um, it's used, I use a, a squirmy worm, basically, um, and I attach it to a, a stainless steel, and I use some um, Solaris resin basically to uh, to cover it and uh, put some eyes on there. This thing, so uh, next week I'm going to be out fishing uh, stripers for my annual trip and um, I'm going to use that. I think it's absolutely going to slay the striped bass, but I don't want to, I was like, okay, should I tie a video and put it out or wait? And I always want to wait because mm -hmm. again, I don't, I'm not promoting anything. So I don't want to create a video that's just BS, if you know what I mean. Right. Oh yeah. I totally understand. Uh, I, on the other hand, I just, I videotape whatever I'm doing and then maybe I'll fish it. Maybe I won't fish it. I don't know. Maybe I'll give it to a friend, but I've been on the, I've been on the popper kick lately on, uh, making poppers. So I've been, that's what my Instagram has been filled with. So, um, yeah, you know, it's summertime. I can sit outside and do that, you know, without having to worry about them blowing away. It looked like you to, were using a wine cork. Is that right? Or a champagne cork? Yeah, I was using uh, wine corks and it's a mini lathe and uh, been, you know, just sandpaper and, and ran them down, cup them out and then, uh, you know, slice them, slide the hook in with some baking soda and um, super glue and then prime them and airbrush them. And uh, it's Saturday, Friday, Friday will be the first day I'll have one out. I've got two finished that I finished up this week and I'm going to take those two out and see how they look. And then I'll figure out what I'm going to do from there. If I'm going to keep up with what I've got or if I'm going to make modifications. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it's so much fun just to be able to, to sit and, and I think you get pride off catching one that you've tied, but I think you really get a lot of pride and you, and you especially, you know, exemplify this of tying something, going out and catching it and then sharing both the catch videos and the, the tie videos. And I think that really is one thing that sets your channel apart. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. It takes a little longer because I could just crank out videos, tying random flies, but yeah, I, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I'm in it for the long haul. I'm not in it for the, the short term. You know, I'd like uh, to have a reputation out there of, you know, Hey, Brian gives a shit about what he's putting out there. It's not just junk. And as a, you know, a fly fisherman who is, you know, I've, I've had awesome mentors, you know, and people that have helped me. But for those of you that don't, I'd like you to be able to at least go to the channel and know you're not just being fed. Hey, you know, he wants me to buy X, Y, Z, P, Q. Right. It's not about making money. It's about sharing, sharing knowledge with people. 
Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I'll tell you what, I want to talk to you because I want to get you out here for the sow bug roundup. So definitely, and hope that uh, Patty's son doesn't have his boat for a uh, striper season next year so we can actually go fish one day. Oh, that would be awesome. I yeah. would love that. Yeah, Patty's got a boat, so I'm going to be staying at Patty's house a lot this summer. I told my wife, I said, I'm going to go stay with Patty for a week. She goes, who's Patty? I said, she's got a boat. My wife goes, oh, I don't have to worry about anything then. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> she got a kayak. I mean, yeah, I'm not yeah. kayaking the White River, man. That, oh, when yeah, they yeah, start, yeah, yeah. when they start cranking on that, oh, baby, yeah, 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 yeah. it's like <laughs> it's like riding a surf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've 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 been out there twice. I've fished it maybe six days total. So yeah, but I, I was I was the dumb guy that walked out there the first night, and the water was low, and we were catching fish left and right, and it was awesome. And the next thing I know, the water's up to my hips. And I'm yep. like, oh my God, the the little, you know, ditch that I walked through to get out here is now a raging torrent. Yeah. I was we almost that, swimming across. Yeah. The last time we were down there, we rented a house right on the river. It's an Airbnb. A cool, cool place. The guy that owns it lives right next door. Really nice guy. Nice, great place to rent from. Um, and we go out there that morning and we're standing there and we're just fishing. And the water's coming up. We're like, oh, we're fine. And we turn around. We got to wade through two feet of cold, cold water to get back into the yard, oh, yeah. you know, because there was just a little dip. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. Oh. yeah. And I've heard nightmare stories of guys that are like, stranded on a rock. <laughs> yeah, I was almost that guy. I mean, yeah. I was, you know, up to water, up to here, and I'm yeah. tiptoeing. And then I was like crawling through bushes. I got to land. I, I wasn't even able to get to where I originally came in. Uh, yeah. And they, they don't follow the schedule down there. The core does not follow the schedule down there as well. Like if I go other places, I can, I can read the schedule and know what it is. They said it was supposed to start pumping one day at like 10 in the morning. We got up at like four, got all of our kayaks. We're going to launch at dawn. We know where we're going to go. We know what the flow should be got down there they had started generating at like two in the morning oh geez. and it was just blown out i mean it was like uh, yeah we're not doing that today <laughs> let's uh, go to the buffalo river <laughs> yeah but you got um what was it? buffalo springs right isn't that what it is uh no, i don't know about that the buffalo river's down just it's south of what south of yellville okay which is okay. 30 miles west to, i don't know 15 miles west of cotter i'd say Okay. So there may be a Buffalo Springs on there, but the Buffalo River is really, really pretty, and it's great for smallies. Oh, that's so, cool. And then the Kings River is down there, at, or Crooked Creek, I'm sorry, Crooked Creek is down there, and that is where the trophy smallies are. If you really want to have a good time and float for smallies, um, don't go during the dry time because it gets low, but, man, they've got some beautiful smallies down there. I could spend a month in Arkansas just in that 60-mile radius and never get bored. It's, yeah. it's absolutely wonderful. I'm trying to move down there. Oh, cool. I think so. it's beautiful too. Yeah. The white river. I, the time that I've spent there was just fantastic. The yeah. fishing, the people. Yeah. I want to go yeah. back to, they've got a school less than a mile from the white river. And I'm trying to get my wife to let us move down there and teach down there. You know, I'm like, she's like, but there's no, I'm like, we don't need anything. And the river's right there. <laughs> <laughs> that's all we need we got a fly shop over here and we got the river right there yeah dallies yeah <laughs> yeah i got yeah. to talk to him at the sow bug actually after the sow bug i got to talk to him a little bit he is he's funny yeah i, I don't know if you've ever talked to him or not but he no. is he's friggin' hilarious yeah you know and he's from like australia or new zealand australia. or somewhere and he's yeah, yeah. he's friggin' hilarious it was it was funny so i thought about inviting him on i don't know if he'll remember me or not but i thought about inviting him on i'm like i don't know if we'll be able to understand everything he has to say with that thick accent. he'll make Especially a joke or something drinking look out yeah he'll call me some name and i'll think it's like a nice name and find out it's an <laughs> insult from australia and everybody will be laughing at me but, you know that's the way it is so um trout tornado brian i tell you what uh you put up some amazing videos i absolutely love what you've been doing i've taken inspiration from it i've i've done some one way i've done some a little bit different way uh the copper top one of them i put uh put the fly tires dungeon down then i put marabou on top of it to stand it up a little bit you know to and i thought well i'm gonna try it but that's the great thing about it is you can always explore and always look and see what's going on so we look forward to your next video man uh really appreciate you taking time out of your day 
um, probably a nice day up there. You'd probably rather be fishing than talking to me. <laughs> it's all good. It's just been great. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Talk to you after a while. And guys, hopefully we'll be back next week.